Yeah, I mean, hell, I might, I might have a lot more money if I, uh, if I fell victim to the machine. You know, the machine works for a lot of people. But I also think that machines, they change to fit things that work. And a lot of the, the bands that move me are bands that didn't chase after the machine. They chased after what they were hearing and what they were feeling, you know, and uh, then the machine started chasing them. And it's like, that's the kind of artist that I want to be, is just someone who kind of does, does what's true to me. And that's what music's about. It's about just trying to, to amplify the, the inner voice to the world and hopefully make someone feel the way that music makes you feel. Good to go. Drive Me Mad was a song that was written uh, just one night Graham and I were hanging out and we said, oh, we need a, a barn burner. We need something fast. And, and he loves to play the drums. And I believe I had a, a set of drumsticks hidden because I think Caleb normally takes his sticks so people won't play his drums. <laughs> and uh, Graham started playing this really fast groove and the guitar riff happened. And we wrote that song in like 10 or 15 minutes. It was just like something that we wanted to rock, so we did. A lot of times we're, we just kind of write them and forget about them, you know? Like we had 55 songs going into this record and we all sat around my kitchen table with, you know, pad and pen and wrote down all the songs that we thought actually had a shot and we agreed on 27 of the 55. So then we had to learn all 27 to where if you said, yo, play this song, we could play it. And then, you know, songs, for, for us in the shakedown, it, they either sink or swim based on if we can deliver them with our instruments and our voices. We, d we don't want to rely on, uh, you know, backing tracks or computers or, you know, we want to be able to just set up in a bowling alley and play our music and not have to worry about anything else.
I was 11 years old, I met this man, Roosevelt Twitty. I have his name right here, so I can keep him with me every time I play. I met him in a music shop, and he was singing Texas Flood, uh, the Stevie Ray Vaughan song, but he was singing it and playing it like Lightning Hopkins, like Lightning Hopkins' Home Out in the Woods, uh, specifically. And I was just mesmerized, floored by it. And uh, I, I walked up and was just paying attention, and he said, do you like the blues? And I said, I don't know what that is. He's like, this is the blues. And I said, well, then I love the blues. He goes, I'll teach you. And so he became my best friend, started giving me John Lee Hooker cassettes and, you know, a Bobby Blue Bland VHS and like all this just awesome music. Taught me about Freddie King and Muddy Waters. And through him, I met a guy that gave me a slide and said, you know, put it on your pinky because that's how Muddy Waters played it. And, you know, through Mr. Twitty, um, sharing music with me, it, that changed the whole course of my life. You know, and I realized how powerful just giving someone a record can be, you know? So Ride was a song that I that I wrote by myself, and I was listening to a lot of Junior Kimbrough and R.L. Burnside, some of the like heavy Mississippi guys, and I 
I wanted the guitar to sound like you took a bunch of Mississippi dirt and put it in a jar with a bunch of like Texas dirt and shook it up, and, you know, dumped it all over the track. I realized that there needed to be a little bit of positivity in the record. And, and just one day I was feeling good and started writing those, those lyrics just about enjoying the moment you're in and not, not taking life too seriously, not trying to make a bunch of plans and, you know, figure out what's next and just, just being in the moment. So it's one of my favorite songs to play. Something I've learned from, from doing this for, for a second is a lot of times if you want something done, you have to figure out how to do it yourself. When I moved to town, I was 17 years old. I didn't have a pot to piss in. I couldn't go pay 250 bucks every time I wrote a song and needed to make a demo. But I also realized if I didn't make a demo, the song would just, it would get forgotten. It would, you know, another one would happen, then another one would happen, and then pretty soon you've, you've lost it forever. And so I got in this habit of going, okay, I'm gonna demo every song I write. Whether I think it's good or whether I think maybe it could be better, I'm gonna at least get a snapshot of it. Sometimes, sometimes a demo could just be setting up a microphone and singing the song once. But I think part of, part of the process for me is really zooming in and working out parts and experimenting and, you know, recording has become sort of the way I practice. Like I make, almost every day I make a, a track, a backing track to practice to, you know? And I've made a lot of them available for you know, kids who follow me on Instagram or whatever to practice to too, because if I sit down with a guitar, a lot of times I just sound like I'm, you know, sitting at Guitar Center on a Saturday morning and kind of playing the same licks. So having chords that move and trying to, you know, just come up with new things to play to keep myself engaged and excited about the instrument, um, that's, something, that's something I enjoy doing. And a lot of times that turns into songs. A lot of the songs on the new, al new album just started out as me trying to make something to practice to.
Eye to Eye is a song that we kind of had to fight for. We realized that we were just really kind of ripping off Soundgarden. And so we, we kind of put a, put a stop to the track, stepped away from it, and then the next day Graham came in and he had some stuff going on in his personal life and he said, yeah, you know, we're just, we're not seeing eye to eye. And it was like, ding, ding, ding. And so we scrapped a lot of the riffs that we were messing with and we came up with the riffs that you hear in the song now. All we needed was that title because I kept taking the instrumental track home and, and singing over it and I wasn't finding the right thing. And then as soon as he said that, it was, you see right through me, the same way that I'm looking through you, you cut me with your point of view. Like we, it just happened really quickly, but it, <laughs> it took a lot of, you know, fighting to make sure that we weren't straight ripping off Soundgarden and trying to do something original. Um, and that's one thing, I actually, um, I talked to Mike Campbell about this. I'm a huge Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers fan. And, and he actually said, you know, D don't worry, you know, if you, if you think that you're, you know, ripping something off, don't let that get in the way of you writing a song. You can always change it later. When it comes to the creative process, when you constantly have these walls, these parameters to work within, it's that like stifles the whole thing. So it's like, why don't we just make something? We call it throwing paint at the wall. Let's throw some paint at the wall and see what's pretty. Like, let's see, maybe something good happens, maybe it doesn't, but we showed up. We showed up and we tried. Well, it's so easy to, to kind of find your, your licks that work or find your little tricks, you know, and, and we, don't get me wrong, we lean on a lot of those things. We go, oh yeah, we do this and we feel like we do this well, so let's do that. But then I think having a band like like I do, where where these guys go, come on, TB, push push yourself, go a little a little harder and uh, or or hey man, I've heard you do that. What else you got? We all push each other. So like in the studio we're constantly egging each other on and going, come on. Give me something, like, give me something more. And uh, I, I love that, man. It's like getting into a boxing ring with your friends. <laughs>